Kia ora mai tātou. I te iwi o te motu, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora tātou katoa. Greetings everyone. I've just acknowledged you as people of the land. That acknowledgement is based on the concept that if you eat food from the land, you are connected to that land. You are of that land. Equally, that greeting gives me the chance to acknowledge Tuwhore Toa, our local iwi. They have chosen to never develop their farmland, further develop their land, or to intensify it in order to protect the water quality of Lake Taupo. If they hadn't chosen to do that, Sharon and I would not be able to continue farming in the way we do today. How do you choose your food? Is your decision based on price, quality, nutritional value, brand, local, or country of origin? Or is it for ethical reasons, whether it's produced in a way that will protect our waterways? However you answer those questions, the reality is we need to grow more food than ever before to feed a growing population. My husband, Mike here, is now 64, and when he was born in 1952, there were just two billion people on this planet. Yet today, only six decades later, there are over 7.5 billion people. Our global population has more than tripled within his lifetime. It's not all my fault, all right? <laughs> we now know from science that food production, all food production, leaves an environmental footprint on both land and waterways. This creates a huge challenge for mankind. How to feed a growing population while at the same time protect our environment? So on the one hand, if we want to look after this environment, we can't continue to intensify our food production systems and our farmland. Yet, if we need to feed that population that Sharon's talked about, or as a food producer, if I'm to stay in business, I must intensify. This tension is perhaps best exemplified by the tension between our two largest industries, agriculture and tourism. Tourism relies on New Zealand's clean, green image in order to attract visitors to this country and is often critical of farming if it threatens that image. Yet those three million plus visitors each year must be fed and many of those visitors come to New Zealand specifically to sample the food and wine that we grow. Science is telling us that all food production has an impact on the environment, and I'm talking about vegetables, cereals, meat, rice, dairy. All of it has an impact on our water and our air. There is only so much that food producers can do to reduce that impact. Sure, we can plant more trees, we can fence off waterways, riparian planting. We can reduce intensification. But all of those things reduce our ability to produce food. Equally, if we stay in the commodity food market, we are unlikely to remain financially viable. So how did we get to talk to you about this issue? Sharon and I grew up in Auckland and had careers in tertiary education. In my case, in management, and in Sharon's, she was a languages lecturer. You could say that due to something of a late midlife crisis on my part, we left Auckland and went farming on the western shores of Lake Taupo about 12 years ago. Now, we knew there were challenges coming to farming within that catchment with respect to protecting the water quality of Lake Taupo. But we wanted to get involved in the process. We actively engaged in science and policy to try and influence the outcome. If legislation was going to be passed to cap farming, we needed to know that it was workable. So the real issue here is that Lake Taupo is a nitrogen-sensitive water body. And if farming were allowed to continue to intensify, the nitrogen from stock urine could lead to algal growth and this could damage the water quality of the lake. In essence, this is a livestock numbers issue, it is not a fertiliser issue. Our farm has been the site of numerous on-farm scientific research projects looking at ways 
of minimising the impact of our farm systems on the environment. I suspect we run the highest stocking rate of scientists per hectare in the country. <laughs> As a trout fisherman and a farmer, I have had to live the tension between these two perspectives. I needed to reconcile those perspectives, perspectives so that I could sleep at night. Torpol is the first place in New Zealand to have environmental law to protect a water body. Farmers in the Torpol catchment and areas surrounding the lake where eventually their runoff and nitrogen will enter the lake, have accepted a cap on stock numbers in perpetuity. Our farm has been capped at its 2004 stock numbers, and it's unlikely we'll ever increase them. From an environmental point of view, this is fantastic. Yet from an economic one, this is a huge challenge, not only to us, but New Zealand. You see, the environmental cost of food production has never been built into the price you pay for food. And unlike other countries around the world, our food is not subsidised, and nor are our farmers. There is a cost to protecting our waterways and environment, and no one wants to pay for it. And in honesty, the farming community cannot bear this cost alone. It is the first time in New Zealand that we've actually said to an industry, you have a responsibility to all of society and you cannot grow your business because of your impact on the environment. And in our case, the water quality of Lake Taupo. The price that we as, as producers receive for the food that we grow in real terms has steadily declined. Because of that, We've relied on intensifying our lands and our businesses in order to stay ahead of rising costs. Yet under a cap, we can no longer adhere to this business model. A cap on production, or in our case, stock numbers, is really a cap on income. To drive home this point, we all know that cars pollute. It would be like saying to a car dealership here in Toronga in August, sorry guys, it's August, You've sold your quota for the year. Now, for the sake of society and the Bay of Plenty region, you can sell no more cars until next year. Yet they'd still have rising costs and bills to pay. And other car dealerships around New Zealand could sell any number that they like. The economic modelling of a nitrogen cap and its impact on farmers is incredibly sobering. We urgently needed to find a new way forward if those farmers were to stay in business. Or put another way, Sharon and I can no longer grow the quantity of meat that we produce per hectare. In order to stay ahead of those rising costs, could we grow the value of that meat? The idea of creating our own brand came about one morning when my husband said to me, Honey, if I were a tourist fisherman from Montana, USA, and I spent the whole day out trout fishing on our beautiful lake and amazed at the pristine water quality, I'm sure if I went back to my hotel that night to a delicious meal, I'd be prepared to pay slightly more for a quality product which also protected our beautiful lake. With this in mind, six years ago, we created or started our own beef brand, Torpal Beef. Our aim was to grow a brand so that we could take on more farmers from within the Torpal catchment as suppliers, gain a premium, that would help compensate for the environmental cost of protecting the lake and hopefully allow these farmers to stay in business. We started by asking consumers what they wanted and they told us the following. Traceability, consistent quality, grass-fed, no antibiotics and no growth hormones were all essential attributes to the meat that they were looking at purchasing. But above all else, they wanted real claims around our environmental performance. We're not talking about a marketing person just flapping their arms. With this in mind, and given that the Waikato Regional Council was, was looking to cap and audit every farm within the catchment, it seemed to us that we could look upon this process as a negative or a bummer, or it could form the basis of a validation of our brand claims around water quality. 
Waikato Regional Council agreed with us and created the first and only environmental tick, which assures you as customers that the meat that you're purchasing from us has been grown in a manner that will protect the water quality of Lake Taupo. This tick can only occur because there is a catchment-wide cap on the total amount of nitrogen entering the lake and because every farm in the catchment is audited annually. In order to supply the brand that we've created, farmers must obviously farm within the catchment and they must be fully compliant with the legislation designed to protect the lake. We then proceeded with a four-month trial with just three restaurants to test whether consumers would be willing to pay slightly more for a quality product that protects our lake for our great-grandchildren. One of the restaurants was in a prestigious hotel in town and we asked them to make our meat the most expensive on their menu. At the time, they had an Angus eye fillet on the menu for $38.50 and they made an equivalent dish with our eye fillet, our branded eye fillet, for $42.50. Ours was the only one in the $40 range. Three weeks later, the head chef rang me, and he said, you're outselling the Angus dish four to one. He increased the price from $42.50 to $46.50, and sales reduced to ours outselling just one, uh, two to one. We'd hit price resistance. There are obviously limits to what a consumer will spend. However, this gave us the confidence to try and, to try and grow our brand in a more commercial and permanent basis. Five years later, we joined with a national distributor to take our brand to the Auckland and Wellington market. We always knew that consumers in Taupo may purchase our product based on it being a local product and we needed to see whether outside consumers would be willing to pay slightly more for a quality product that protects our largest lake. So far, so good. I'm happy to report that Aucklanders and Wellingtonians do value water quality, and now our brand of meat is available in many parts of the North Island. As New Zealanders, we should all be incredibly proud that our largest lake, Lake Taupo, is one of the cleanest lakes in the world. And I believe everything has now been done in order to protect it for future generations. The OECD recently reviewed the Topo catchment approach, and it considers it an example or a model of best practice, which it is now disseminating and recommending all over the world. Something to talk about at your next dinner party. So the reality is, if you don't feel incentivized to pay a premium for food that's grown in a manner that protects water quality, one of two things is going likely to happen. Either we as a nation will not achieve the water quality goals that we all want, or we will drive food production offshore to countries that don't yet value water quality. So when you next go out to purchase food, will you actively seek out food that's grown in a manner that protects water quality? To be honest, I suspect you won't. And part of, that part of that issue is that we as farmers have never talked to you about this issue in this way, and we've never made that food available to you, so you had such a choice. If that choice was there, the premium that you were willing to pay for an exceptional product that protects water quality will reveal in, in real terms how much you value that water quality. That premium is the true measure of your commitment to water quality. Just blaming the farmer is the easy way out. The reality is we all eat food. Therefore, don't we all have a responsibility to the environmental cost of that food? Eating is the final step in the agricultural process. It is not divorced from it. So I ask you, who is the real polluter? Ka ora te whenua, ka ora te wai, ka ora ai te iwi. If the land is well, if the water is well, the people will thrive. Kia ora and thank you.